Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are in week 14 of the um, history of British art and uh, today I'd like to talk with you about the interwar period and uh, what happened later. So uh, this is the, uh, the last uh, presentation based on, uh, on the PowerPoint which has been uploaded to Moodle. So, uh, open the, the illustrations and uh, and uh, we'll go uh, through them together. So, um, in many respects, this part is the continuation of last week's discussion, based on the uh, same materials mostly. So the two uh, documentary mini series, one British Art at War and the other British Masters. Uh, they deal with the uh, first half of the uh, of the 20th century and uh, a little bit of uh, about what happened uh, what happened later so uh, some of the names of the artists you know already and uh, most of them had uh, rather long lives and long careers and uh, sometimes uh, their interests and uh, their style changed so um, if we look at the uh, at the interwar period, uh, some names you know already. You know Walter Sickert, you know David Bomberg, uh, you know uh, Stanley Spencer. Uh, we'll meet them. Uh, we'll meet them uh, in a moment. Uh, the first two illustrations uh, show the uh, interwar. Uh, work of David Bomberg, the, uh, the uh, young rebellious Jewish artist, uh, you may recall, one of the vortices uh, for a moment, uh, the uh, artist who experimented with uh, abstract forms, uh, very bold colors, bold shapes. Uh, after the First World War, uh, he was... Um, um, dissatisfied with <clears throat> this kind of uh, painting uh, and uh, he started to look for inspiration elsewhere mostly as many artists uh, did in travel so Bomberg uh, traveled to um, to the Holy Land uh, so we have uh, one of the many paintings he did there are uh, here showing a view uh, of Jerusalem uh, later on, uh, he uh, he travelled to Spain and was especially uh, inspired by uh, the city of Toledo, which uh, had uh, <coughs> uh, other artistic connotations, mostly with uh, the great uh, uh, Greek-born artist El Greco. So, uh, if we look at Bomberg's views of Toledo. They are, um, to some extent, uh, the result of the artist's own travels, to some extent, his um, fascination with, uh, with the art of El Greco. Uh, you'll see what happens later. When the um, civil war started in Spain, uh, Bomberg had to return to Britain, so he will be uh, he will be there uh, during the uh, the blitz, and you will see um, some more of his work. At least another uh, one more uh, work showing London during the blitz in the Second World War. Uh, what happened to Walter Sickert? Uh, he also traveled. He had some favorite places in France, uh, but uh, he uh, started to be inspired with um, the 19th century with uh, Victorian culture. Uh, so. Um, uh, you can see uh, one of the uh, one of the paintings he did in the interwar period. Uh, he um, experimented with uh, rather traditional subjects from Victorian art, but using his uh, typical bold colors. So here we have a, a, a pair walking together in the in the work called the, the Idyll. So, um, it was perhaps the time of, of some sort of idyll for him as well. Uh, he, <clears throat> he worked as an illustrator for um, 
magazines uh, he uh, uh, he became uh, quite respected. Uh, uh, he started giving art lessons, painting lessons. Uh, his uh, most famous uh, uh, pupil will be uh, Winston Churchill. So, uh, as some of you perhaps know already, um, Churchill was a man of many talents. He, uh, he wrote books, he got the Nobel Prize for literature, actually. Uh, for his war memoirs, but he was also uh, very much interested in painting. So uh, in his uh, in his free time, he uh, he painted as a leisure activity, and uh, Walter Sickert uh, taught him that. Uh, actually, when the uh, the Nazis um, started to be a problem in Germany, uh, he apparently uh, suggested that uh, uh, he could volunteer to teach uh, Adolf Hitler painting as well. Uh, he apparently even wrote a, a letter to Hitler about that, but I don't think uh, this was taken seriously. Perhaps uh, the, the fate of the world would be different. Uh, then there were, uh, well, in the, in the interwar period, uh, there are basically two ways of treating art uh, that are dominant in British, uh, in British painting. One is uh, going back to tradition, so something that uh, Sickert uh, did, and uh, we have another artist who uh, who is doing very, very traditional um, paintings, uh, Alfred Munnings. And here we have uh, one of the uh, paintings that are shown uh, in the um, in the documentary. Uh, the title is quite interesting: "My Wife, My Horse, and Myself." And this is precisely what it shows: plus a very uh, rich house. Uh, so he uh, tried to continue the tradition of British portraiture. Uh, going back to the 18th century, to uh, Gainsborough and Reynolds, and especially the uh, animal art, uh, probably inspired most by George Stubbs. Uh, Alfred Munnings was, um, just as Stubbs, was fascinated with, uh, with horses, uh, and uh, a large section of his art is devoted to these, uh, these animals. Uh, uh, if you watch British Masters, you will see and the, uh, the host uh, saying that uh, it should be the other way around and uh, the horse was more important than the wife. So uh, we have many artists going back to tradition, many artists uh, going back to, uh, to patriotism. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some more. Uh, in a moment. The other way of looking at art was um, trying to find a fresh perspective and uh, perhaps the most interesting example of that in, uh, in Britain is um, what happened in Cornwall. Uh, the very deep, very uh, almost the tip of Cornwall Peninsula, the little fishing village of St. Ives, which started to attract artists in the interwar period. Uh, and uh, when they arrived there, well, they were attracted by the light. They, they were attracted by what uh, looked almost Mediterranean uh, in terms of light, in terms of, uh, of the seaside and, uh, and the, uh, the life of the, of the fisher folk. And uh, when some new, modern, uh, rebellious artists, such as Christopher Wood, started to arrive in um, Cornwall, they actually found someone uh, local who became a kind of inspiration for them. And here we have two, uh, two illustrations, um, out of many illustrations, made by a local artist from St. Ives called Alfred Wallace. And he was actually a retired fisherman. Uh, he spent his entire working life um, catching fish, so he was uh, not a trained artist. He was an amateur, um, but um, he, uh, he loved painting. He painted in his free time, and when his wife died, he uh, started using painting as a kind of uh, private therapy uh, to uh, to uh, help him go through the, mm, the grieving 
Uh, and uh, if you look at, uh, at the examples here, or if you Google his name, Alfred Wallace, uh, you'll see that these are um, visibly amateur paintings. They do not have all the classical elements of perspective and uh, art draftsmanship and, uh, and all the things that you could learn at the uh, Royal Academy or any of the art schools, but uh, they were fresh, they were interesting, and uh, they offered a, a very genuine perspective, uh, which uh, provided uh, a kind of modern look, because uh, um, this is what you might call naive painting, but it looks almost abstract, it looks like some aspects uh, of modern painting and uh, for the artists like Christopher Wood who were trained in art, who traveled to, uh, to the continent, especially to Paris, which was the mecca of artists of all kinds, this was um, very similar to, uh, to what was happening in continental art in modern art and it looks surprisingly modern so uh, we have the artist's colony developing in St. Ives. There is another documentary if you wish to, uh, to see it. Uh, the, the title is The Art of Cornwall and uh, it uh, tells you the entire story about the, the artist's colony in St. Ives and what happened later. So um, we have a group of young uh, painters uh, uh, coming there, um, starting to, uh, to work there, uh, and um, this will continue also after the, uh, the war, also after the death of, uh, of Alfred Wallace, uh, who never uh, got uh, rich and famous uh, on his art, but, uh, but he inspired a generation. Uh, Christopher Wood uh, died young, he had um, all kinds of problems with uh, with addiction so um, unfortunately uh, he didn't have a, a long career but some other artists uh, are like uh, Ben Nicholson for example uh, stayed there and uh, and uh, uh, you will uh, see at least one of uh, of his paintings there uh, that is why uh, if you go to St. Ives uh, still you can find a, um, a department of uh, Tate Gallery there so this place became so important to British art that they opened a major uh, major art gallery uh, to um, to display the, uh, the works of art made by artists in Cornwall so we continue in a moment Uh, so we continue with the interwar period and uh, you may recall Stanley Spencer uh, from last week uh, when uh, the, the, the very last uh, painting in the presentation was uh, the memorial he designed for the, uh, for the soldiers killed in the First World War. Uh, in the interwar period, um, of course, he continued uh, his art, he uh, became one of the uh, important names in, uh, in British art and uh, there are uh, several interesting uh, paintings, basically uh, in two kinds or two styles. Uh, the first type of paintings by Stanley Spencer uh, are the paintings um, inspired by um, the, uh, the village life, by the rural life uh, in England, especially uh, the, uh, the uh, little village of Cookham, uh, which uh, he knew very well. He lived there for, uh, for a long time and uh, he started to use it as a background for um, also for, for his kind of um, after-war ruminations, uh, probably the most important of these uh, paintings is the Resurrection, which he painted in 1927, uh, which shows the village church in Cookham, uh, 
and uh, the local people basically raising from the local cemetery on the uh, day of um, of the end of the world on the, uh, the the biblical scene of course of the resurrection and the dead coming back to life um, but uh, taken uh, in a very rural peaceful setting of an english village um, if you watch the documentary, uh, you will see that uh, there is a female form uh, repeated uh, a few times and this was uh, the first wife of uh, Spencer, uh, the local girl he met there and, uh, and married, but um, unfortunately, as with uh, many artists, uh, this um, rural happiness was not to last because he uh, got involved with another woman and uh, here we have um, one of the series of uh, portraits, uh, nude portraits uh, that he started to produce uh, <clears throat> in relation uh, with this woman, Patricia Priest. She was an artist in her own right uh, and she was a kind of femme fatale in his life. Hey, he finally married her, but uh, they had all kinds of problems. Uh, uh, she uh, she had other affairs, so um, he was always uh, very unsure of uh, of her and uh, uh, of himself. And and basically, uh, if you look at the um, self portraits with Patricia Priest. Uh, which he started to paint in the 30s. Uh, this is quite visible because they are not flattering uh, and especially the way that he shows himself as a, uh, as a kind of unsure and, uh, and um, troubled man uh, is quite, uh, quite telling. These are um, paintings that show the, uh, the naked bodies of uh, the artist and his uh, his lover um, basically in close-up <clears throat> so they are not uh, very flattering it seems that the bodies do not really fit into uh, into the form of the painting so uh, parts of them are not even visible uh, the one that you have here uh, from 1937 is um, perhaps the, le the least explicit you don't really see uh, a lot of nakedness. The, the, you can see the breasts of, um, of Patricia, but um, there are other um, paintings from this series in which the, um, the genitals are more visible. So if you, if you want to see something a bit more, um, more shocking, at least for the interwar um, viewing public, uh, just Google or see the, uh, see the documentary uh, because they make much of that. So um, he became one of the big names in, uh, in uh, British art, mostly uh, for uh, these um, almost exhibitionistic um, self-portraits uh, showing <clears throat> what um, has been described as a kind of troubled, <coughs> <coughs> potentially even impotent man. Uh, what uh, else happens before the war? There are uh, some interesting uh, artists and uh, interesting movements. Uh, a theme that uh, is repeated over and over is uh, looking for Englishness. What is English landscape? What is the, uh, the essence of Englishness? And uh, here we have a few works by a young artist uh, uh, who died in uh, in the war. Um, uh, his name was Eric Ravillius, and uh, uh, he was mostly inspired by the south of England, uh, the South Downs, so the uh, the area uh, near the the English Channel. And um, I hope you can uh, remember some of the places that inspired him from our very first class about prehistoric art in Britain. 
the Wilmington Giant and the uh, the chalk horse uh, at uh, Westbury. Uh, so the uh, prehistoric uh, hill paintings, hill figures uh, that were mysterious and uh, and imposing. These were the areas that uh, Revelius would visit. He would be inspired by them and. Um, here we have some uh, some of the uh, some of the works he did uh, uh, showing the landscape with these uh, uh, artistic landmarks. So basically, showing continuity of British art from the prehistoric period to uh, to uh, the um, the modern day. The the. 30s. So we have, for example, the, the Westbury horse is interesting uh, because in the distance you can see the, uh, the train coming. So uh, this is something very ancient matched with something quite uh, new and modern. Uh, so uh, this is perhaps what uh, was understood as, uh, as uh, Englishness. Um, I also included a few works, two works by uh, Winston Churchill. I already mentioned that he was um, a pupil of, uh, of Walter Sickert. Uh, he uh, enjoyed painting. Actually, this was a way for him to deal with uh, the bouts of depression he suffered from <clears throat> throughout his life. So he had a country house in Chartwell and uh, both these uh, uh, pictures that you have here uh, a view from Chartwell and a pond <coughs> show the, uh, the area uh, around uh, this, uh, this house so um, <coughs> as you can see uh, these are mostly landscapes uh, so uh, possibly Winston Churchill was also looking for the English landscape, the Englishness and uh, another artist that you may recall from last week, uh, John Nash, uh, the artist who uh, made quite a big career during the First World War, where he painted those uh, um, devastated landscapes of the uh, of the um, arena of the First World War. In the interwar period, he um, also got interested uh, with uh, the ancient and the mysterious aspects of the English landscape. Uh, he would go um, to paint uh, the the megaliths, the the standing stones uh, <clears throat> in the uh, in the area surrounding uh, the surrounding uh, Stonehenge, so Avebury Circle and and other standing stones, uh, which are <clears throat> again um, prehistoric relics uh, covered in uh, in mystery. <clears throat> he would also experiment with uh, the um, dreamlike landscapes, perhaps inspired by uh, Salvador Dali, uh, so kind of surrealist uh, images, uh, the real landscape morphing into, uh, into uh, something completely imaginary. Uh, Paul Nash had a long career, so uh, you may recall his uh, early works, mostly showing trees and hills of England, uh, then his uh, World War I um, oeuvre, and uh, here we have the interwar uh, interests. Uh, he will also be very, very important uh, during the period of the Second World War. He will be the official painting painter, um, producing artwork, uh, basically documenting and, and used as, uh, as a kind of propaganda for the war effort. So we'll return to, um, to Paul Nash uh, in a moment. Uh, and yes, we'll continue in the next part.